to have learned from him and collaborated with him as, my, as his advisor for the last five years. When Marco joined the lab, he was already obviously a brilliant and creative and interdisciplinary thinker. Our first meeting was supposed to be a quick lunch at Catalyst to talk about metacognition. And three hours later, spanning many of the themes, uh, with the conversation spanning many of the themes you'll hear about in this defense, it was clear that our conversation was just getting started. He's also a natural leader with the authority that grows from deep expertise and the confidence that comes from having worked hard and accomplished something significant. Let me just say one word about that, or to, just to frame the, the defense. I, I've been making probabilistic programming languages for about 15 years. And Marco's platform, Gen, which you'll be hearing about, is a first in several ways. Scalability, practicality, uh, some new conceptual contributions, which you'll hear about more from Marco. But um, I just want to say personally that I find it the first that's actually fun to use, more so than all the languages I wrote. And we've been using it for research and for teaching MIT students for the last two years. And both our industry collaborators, some of whom are here, and our MIT students are saying it's fun and illuminating for them too. So let me hand it over to Marco so that you can hear about some of his wonderful research. All right. Um, thank you, Vikash. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Yeah, thanks, Vikash, and thanks, the uh, members of my committee. So today I will be talking about my work on Gen, a high-level programming platform for probabilistic inference that I created as part of my PhD research. So probabilistic inference is an essential tool in modern, modern artificial intelligence and statistics. And this is the high-level workflow. The user has a mental model of their domain. They formalize this model by writing it down as a probabilistic model. Then they apply probabilistic inference algorithms, which operate on the model and data to produce inferences, predictions, and explanations. And probabilistic inference has applications throughout various science and technology areas and statistics. So some applications include autonomous driving and robotics, uh, human computer interaction, personalized medicine and genomics, and statistics applications in epidemiology. So, Gen is a high-level programming platform to make it easier to use and apply probabilistic inference techniques. And we're still in the early stages of uh, the development of the open source implementation of Gen, but it is, it is already being used by uh, successfully in a number of institutional collaborations and also has an active and enthusiastic user community online. Uh, so before describing what Gen is, I will walk through some of the applications it's already being used for. Uh, this application uses Gen to fit the parameters of surrogate models of ocean temperature data uh, from, generated from high-resolution simulations. Others have used Gen to implement a causal inference technique that corrects for latent confounders via probabilistic inference in a ga hierarchical Gaussian process model. And here Gen is being used for program synthesis. Uh, here the prior, there's a prior distribution on programs, and they're using Bayesian inference with sequential Monte Carlo implemented in Gen over the space of programs. And it turns out that their gen implementation only required 100 lines of code to write the probabilistic generative model and 160 lines of code to write the inference algorithm, whereas a Python implementation of a special case of their technique from ICML a couple of years ago required 1,300 lines of code and the probabilistic generative model was never represented explicitly, making the technique harder to extend. Others are using Gen for research into new combinations of symbolic and probabilistic approaches to AI. Uh, this application infers the goal of an agent moving around a grid using sequential Monte Carlo inference in the generative model, where the model itself is running a symbolic planner. Here is some work I contributed to using Gen. Uh, we inferred a tree structured scene graph that explains the six degree of freedom poses of 3D objects in a scene. And this uses reversible jump MCMC to do Bayesian inference over possible spanning trees of these objects. The resulting scene graph gives us a lower dimensional parameterization of the scene geometry, which is useful for tracking and scene understanding. I've also used Gen to infer camera and object poses from point cloud and depth to camera data. Uh, on the left is an online MCMC algorithm being used to track the pose of a camera relative to the room. And on the right, I'm doing Bayesian inference about the pose of an object from a depth scan. Gen has also been used as the basis for a new class at MIT, as Vikash mentioned, and in several other publications as well. So in this talk, I'll begin with a background of existing programming tools for probabilistic inference. 
And then I'll walk through an example application of Gen to a problem of interpreting humans' behavior. And I'll show what happens when I remove some of the advanced features that are enabled by Gen in this application. And I'll talk about two inference ideas that are important for making inference in this model fast. Specialized transdimensional MCMC and coarse to fine sequential multi parallel. Then I'll give examples of how neural networks can be used uh, with inference in Gen. And finally, I'll talk about the lower level architecture ideas and some performance benchmarks before going on to uh, next steps. So implementing probabilistic inference is challenging because it requires mathematical expertise and the derivations can be, can be buggy and introduce subtle bugs into the algorithm. Um, but it also requires implementing low level numerical code and this can be very error prone. And also writing numerical code efficiently requires a lot of expertise. So as a result, many inference engines and programming tools have been created that automate some or all of this work for the user. Many of these tools are specialized to specific classes of problems. So if you have a problem that fits into one of these classes, that's great and these tools are very valuable, um, but they limit your ability to model, to write the model you want, and instead you end up writing the model that fits within the existing solver's abilities. There are also differentiable modeling languages like PyTorch and TensorFlow that are great platforms for deep learning, but don't provide language level support for other sorts of probabilistic inference. And in parallel, there have been a number of probabilistic programming systems in recent decades that let you express essentially any probabilistic model you want. But inference in these expressive modeling languages can be difficult to automate in a reliable way. For example, uh, consider the church language from 2008. The insight in this system is that essentially any probabilistic model, including interesting non-parametric Bayesian models, can be expressed concisely in the form of code in a general purpose functional programming language. And they give an inference engine based on two generic inference algorithms with which with enough computation give the right answers. So this is a really appealing idea and it means that a whole paper like this one on hierarchical uh, Dirichlet processes can be in principle summarized in just a 10 line program. But several pages of that paper are, are devoted to a specialized inference algorithm for that model. And this is not surprising since efficient inference often requires exploiting some structural or semantic features of the problem. So while church is a powerful conceptual tool for pushing the field forward, it's not a practical tool for inference in real world problems because it relies on generic algorithms that are too inefficient for many problems. So the venture system which built on church recognizes this need to specialize the inference algorithm to the model and introduces a DSL in which users write high level inference programs. And instead of an inference engine, we can think of it as using an inference interpreter. This system is the direct predecessor of Gen, and Gen draws on some ideas in Venture, but also addresses its shortcomings. So in particular, Venture uses an inference DSL that is too restricted and cannot express a lot of the important uh, specializations needed for efficient inference. Also, Venture uses a general purpose low-level language implementation, which does not specialize to the structure of the specific model and gives poor performance as a result. So Gen's design allows for more specialization in two different ways. First, it supports an extensible set of modeling languages that specialize the low-level implementation of inference to the structure of the model. For example, Gen's static modeling language supports efficient incremental computation during MCMC, and the Gen PyTorch language supports efficient deep learning. Each modeling language implements a compiler that generates a specialized implementation of an abstract data type for inference called a trace. And modeling languages can also specialize this trace implementation to the user's specific model. The abstract data type then exposes a set of primitive operations for inference with which users write an open-ended open set of inference programs in a general purpose programming language, in this case, Julia. And this allows them to write more efficient and specialized inference algorithms at a higher level of abstraction. So together, the ability to specialize the low-level implementation inside the trace data type and the inference algorithm on top of the trace data type lets Gen achieve much better performance than its predecessor system, Venture. And Gen includes a number of technical contributions that have been published in several venues, including in PLDI in 2019 and PLDI in 2018, um, as well as some manuscripts. And there are features of Gen that I'll talk about in this, in this talk and that are described in my dissertation that have not been published in, in conferences, um, but are actually part of the open source implementation. So specifically, I'm gonna show how Gen um, can be used. Next, I'm gonna show how a gen can be used to infer a person's goals from their motion. Um, so here's our example. So suppose 
there's an apartment and there's a person sitting on the couch in this apartment. So we're going to track this person's location over time. And our goal is to figure out if they're leaving the apartment or not. And the exit of the apartment is in the lower right hand corner. So as they move around the apartment, uh, I, I will ask you to raise your hand as soon as you're pretty sure that they're leaving the apartment. I can't see you, but I'll trust you to do it. Uh, so here they go. Okay, so in that example, uh, I think that when the person gets around here, I think it seems likely they could be leaving the apartment. But then as soon as they turn into this area here, which is actually the kitchen, um, it seems like they're probably not headed to the exit. Right? So here's another example. Again, try to think about whether they're leaving or not and raise your hand when, when they, you think they're leaving. Okay, so in this example, as soon as they pass by the kitchen, we think, well, they're headed into the hallway now. There's a decent chance they're leaving. And then as soon as they pass by this bathroom door here, um, you know, we, the probability they're leaving goes up because why else would they be headed into this area of the room, of the apartment? So let's do one more example. Okay, so in this case, I think as soon as they enter the bedroom, it becomes pretty obvious they're not trying to leave. Um, but if I told you that they typically store their keys either on this countertop here or on this bedside table down here, and that they always get their keys before they leave the apartment, then we might think they maybe are leaving the apartment and we could explain their trajectory like this. Maybe they looked for their keys here at the countertop. They didn't find them. So then they went to this bedside table and searched there. Maybe they found them there and maybe they're about to leave. But a perfectly fine explanation also is that they're just going to take a nap. So here we have at least two good explanations about the sequence of events. Um, so we've, we've narrowed down the possibilities, but we can't quite be sure. In this case, they ended up leaving the bedroom after they got their keys and headed towards the exit. So we write the first time. So these are the sorts of inferences that we're going to automate using probabilistic inference in gen. And back in 2017, when I was spending a lot more time outside in the grass and trees on MIT's campus, I implemented an example of this demo in this nice outdoor setting. Um, but this time again, I'm again surrounded, uh, inspired by my surroundings and things have changed a little bit. Okay, so now I'll give an overview of how to solve this problem using Gen. Uh, the first step is to describe a generative model that describes the domain. So we're just gonna model the floor plan and that's gonna be shown on the right. So here's the code defining the probabilistic generative model for the movement of a person who's leaving their apartment. So in gen, generative models are represented as stochastic simulators written in modeling languages like this one, which is embedded in the Julia programming language. And this simulator is a lot like a regular Julia function, but we use the gen macro here to indicate that this code should be interpreted as a generative model. The inputs to the generative model are the things we know a priori beforehand. This includes the floor plan and the start location. So I mentioned that the simulator is stochastic. Uh, the random choices that the simulator makes, denoted with this tilde notation, are things that we do not know a priori. So the first random choice is the number of times the person searches for their keys before they successfully find them. And we're going to give this a geometric distribution. And what distinguishes this function from a regular Julia function is that random choices are recorded in a special data structure called a trace, shown in the bottom right. And during the execution of this function, we sampled a value of two for the number of attempts. So this function is going to simulate the path of a person as they move around their apartment and search for their keys and then finally leave. And this path starts at the start location. Now each location at which they search for their keys is sampled from a probability distribution called likely key location that's concentrated around the two points I described earlier over here where they usually keep their keys. So here we happened to sample the location shown by the purple dot. And this is the first location where the person is going to search for their keys. And this value also gets recorded in the trace. Next, we run a path planning algorithm to generate a reasonably efficient path from their previous location, which was the blue dot, to their next location, which is the purple dot. And here I used a rapidly exploring random tree algorithm with trajectory optimization. And the generated path is shown by this arrow. 
So then we enter the next iteration of the for loop and sample the second location where they search for their keys, which is shown by the second purple dot. And that also gets recorded in the trace. And then we run the path planner again to generate the person's path from the first purple dot to the second purple dot. And finally, we sample a point near the exit, which is shown in green on the floor plan. And we finish the path by running a path planner to generate a path from the second purple dot to the exit location. So now we have this person's simulated path as they're moving around their apartment and uh, searching for their keys and then leaving. The last step is to simulate hypothetical noisy observations of their location at regular time intervals. Um, we model variations in the person's walking speed using ideas from dynamic time warping as well as sensor noise. And each of the observed locations is also stored in the trace. So if we had run the simulator a second time, we would get a different values uh, for all the random choices and a different trace. So this model really represents a probability distribution on traces. So if we, if we sample from this distribution, we get traces that look like this. So here's one sample. Um, this person searched for their keys once near their bedside table and then left. Here's another sample where they happen to already have the keys in their pocket and they just left. Here's another example where they're sort of rummaging all around their apartment looking for their keys and then leave. And we can generate more samples like this. So, but our goal was to infer whether someone is leaving or not based on their trajectory. So to answer this question using probabilistic inference, we need to have a model for what they do when they're not leaving their apartment, right? We need an alternative model. So here's a generative model for what they do when they stay in their apartment. Instead of looking for their keys, if the person is staying in the apartment, they could be doing all sorts of things. So we're gonna model those activities using a collection of, a connect, collection of waypoints of unknown purpose. And we don't know how many waypoints there'll be, so we sample this from a Poisson distribution. Um, also each waypoint, because it's of unknown purpose, is sampled uniformly from the area in the floor plan. So when we run that model, we get samples like this. Um, it has them moving all around. Sometimes they just stay on their couch, as, as in these two examples with the blue dots. So given some observed data D, uh, which is this trajectory, we could perform Bayesian model comparison by evaluating how well each model explains the data by estimating marginal likelihoods and then combining this with the prior odds that they're leaving to get the posterior odds of leaving versus staying. However, with Gen, we're gonna take a more efficient approach. So instead of separately estimating marginal likelihoods, we're gonna create one bigger model that combines these two models. And first we'll notice that both models use the same noise model here. So we're gonna factor that noise model out and instead have the stay model and leave model both return the path itself. Then we create a combined model that invokes either the leave model or the stay model to generate the path. And which model it uses is itself random. And this is determined by a Bernoulli random choice um, called is leaving that returns true with probability 0.1. So here are some samples from this combined model. Um, in most of the samples, the person is staying in their apartment. Uh, and it's not until the ninth sample that we actually get one where the person's leaving. And again, in all these samples, the pink dots represent these waypoints of unknown purpose. Okay, next I'll show automated inference that we obtain using this generative model. And then I'll discuss the gen features that make this inference possible. So on the left is an observed trajectory where the person walks to their bedside table, looks for their keys, finds them, and then leaves. And on the right, I'm showing inferences from our gen inference program that I'll show later. And the inferences are intuitive. Uh, we start off with a probability of around 10% that they were leaving. And then as soon as they walk to their bedside table, the probability jumps to around 50% that they're leaving because the bedside table is where they store their keys. And then as soon as they also walk into the exit hallway, the probability jumps up again to around 80%. So if we remove the knowledge about where the person typically stored their keys and don't provide that knowledge to the inference algorithm, then the probability that they're leaving stays low the entire time until they actually are physically moving towards the exit in the hallway. Okay, here's another example. This is the example where they're getting off the couch, walking around the counter and, and returning. And here the probability starts off around 10% that they're leaving. But then as soon as they turn into the kitchen, they're headed away from the exit. So the probability goes down to near zero. So in those plots, I was showing the inferred probability of leaving versus staying, but inference in this generative model is actually, actually gives us much richer information. 
So we get explanations of the person's behavior in terms of events, which are these pink uh, waypoints. And we can predict future events as well, as well as uh, future trajectories of the person based on what we've inferred. So in the center bottom plot, those two errors, arrows are showing locations where, we, where the inference thinks that there was some event. The person wouldn't otherwise just walk around this countertop for no reason. They must have been doing something over there. And those that's represented by the pink dots. Um, so here's a same animation for the trajectory when they get their keys and then leave. And the arrow in the bottom left here shows the purple dots, which represent the inference that the person was probably looking for their keys there. So to highlight the role of prior knowledge and symbolic reasoning, here's an observed trajectory where the person first walks down to their bedside table, looks for their keys there, doesn't find them, walks back to the countertop, looks for their keys there, doesn't find them again, walks back to their bedside table, checks again, and finally finds their keys and then leaves the apartment. So intuitively, it's a pretty big coincidence if they're going back and forth between these two locations, um, but not looking for their keys. So this is reflected in our automated inferences, which indicate that the person is probably leaving their apartment even before they're physically anywhere near the apartment. In fact, they're still in this, in this bedroom um, at this time. So again, here's the richer animation showing the inferred search events in purple. Okay, so now I'll show the gen implementation at a high level that produced these results. And this, this implementation is gonna implement an algorithm that combines several techniques, including resample move particle filtering, reversible jump MCMC, and data-driven proposals, and is quite specialized for this model. But despite the complexity, the code is pretty concise because it builds on primitives provided by Gen. And then afterwards, I'll demonstrate that the complexity and specialization are actually needed for efficient inference in this application. So here's the top level Gen inference code. I'm not gonna go too much into detail here, but I will just make some key points. Um, first, this is implementing a sequential Monte Carlo algorithm. And this is basically plain Julia code. It's using Julia's for loops and Julia's multi-threading support to parallelize rejuvenation kernels running on individual particles. Um, the most important take home message from this code though is that it's using traces, which is the data type that Gen provides for storing inference state. Gen also provides a library of operations on traces, including the generate and update operations. And finally, the MCMC rejuvenation kernel here is a function that takes a trace as input and returns a new trace as output. Oops. So here's the implementation of that kernel. Um, it is written in a special composite kernel DSL that's provided by Gen. And this kernel actually invokes several primitive MCMC kernels. The two shown here are generic kernels where the user just selects what random choices they want to propose to and the Gen automates the rest. Um, the DSL also dynamically checks certain invariants that are sufficient for soundness of the kernel. So for example, here the composite kernel applies a different primitive kernel depending on whether the current trace has the person leaving or staying. And the primitive kernels inside these branches aren't allowed to change the value of that predicate. The most important part of this code though is the other MCMC kernels shown here, which are custom kernels written by the user that are specialized for this model. And this specialization makes them efficient. So in particular, there's three types of specialization used here. Uh, first, the switch branch kernel implements an efficient reversible jump move to switch between the leave model and the stay model. The second kernel runs fast inference in a coarse and discrete version of this model based on gridding the floor plan into rectangles. And the third kernel uses data-driven proposals to propose locations of waypoints based on heuristic uh, waypoint detector run on the observed data. So these are all types of specializations that are important for efficient inference in this model, but that other probabilistic programming systems don't support. And I'll show how Gen makes it easier to construct these specialize, uh, specialized kernels later in the talk. So before that, here's the high level overview of what the Gen program looks like. Um, so there's several different languages involved. In red is Julia code, which is the top level inference program. In blue is probabilistic modeling code, which is used to describe the generative model on the left. But it's also used to describe proposal distributions that are used within MCMC kernels on the bottom. And also there is a the composite kernel DSL I showed where we can compose different kernels um, shown in purple. And then in green, there's another auxiliary DSL provided by Gen for describing bijections that are used inside trans-dimensional MCMC moves. And I'll, I'll talk about that more later as well. <clears throat> 
OK, so now I'll show what happens when we remove some of the features of this model and inference algorithm. So remember, there's no upper limit to the number of waypoints or search attempts that, that the person makes in our model, because um, we sample them from Poisson and geometric distributions. So this is called an open universe model, and it allows for the complexity of the explanation to adapt as the data set becomes more complex, as we saw earlier. So do we really need this feature, though? Um, so here is our original open universe model. And I'm going to modify it into a closed universe model where there's only a single event in the person's path. So instead of calling these other submodels for leaving and staying, I just inlined the code here, which is very simple in this case. Um, there's one destination in each case. And this inference code, the inference code for this is also simplified, but I'm not going to show that here. So the inferences for this closed universe model work fine for simple data sets. So in this case, the person is you know, just walking from the couch into this other room. And the inference infers that the person's probably not leaving. So that, that makes sense. Um, in this other example, the person walks from the couch straight to the exit. And the system infers that they're probably leaving as soon as they are in the hallway. That also makes sense. But on a more complex data set where you have many events like this one, where the person's walking back and forth, the closed universe model is too inflexible to capture what actually happened. So what's, worth, what's worse, instead of recognizing that it can't understand, it actually gives very confident but very wrong answers. So here it's very confident that the person is headed into the corner of this room, even though they have long left that area and are now walking into the hallway towards the exit. It's also very confident that they're staying in the apartment, which is very wrong in this case. OK, so it's not too hard to confuse this closed universe model. But what about our open universe model? So we can play a game called Confuse the AI. And here, we're going to walk a path uh, in number one here that starts by going back and forth um, between these two points and trying to give the AI lots of evidence that we're not leaving the apartment. Then we're going to change it up and walk back and forth between these two locations down here where we're pretending that we're looking for our keys. And then we're going to walk back to the couch. And then we're going to leave the apartment. So the sequence is intended to uh, confuse the AI. And in particular, we're trying to lead the inference program down this garden path. And it's possible to lead human reasoners down a garden path by giving them lots of evidence for one hypothesis, which they can then get stuck in and unable to update their beliefs when new data comes in later. So let's see if this tricks our inference program that we implemented in Gen. Uh, so here are the results. It turns out that our inference algorithm works fine in this case, even though this involves 12 different events and a roller coaster of beliefs. Um, it, uh, sorry, and a roller coaster of beliefs, the program is able to update its beliefs correctly as new evidence arrives. So here it has a, even though there's plenty of evidence they weren't leaving, as soon as their evidence amounts that they are leaving, the program is able to uh, incorporate that evidence and behave correctly. So let's see what happens, though, when we weaken this algorithm by removing the specialized MCMC kernels but keeping the generic ones. So this algorithm has been garden passed because it's very confident the person's leaving, even though the recent evidence suggests, uh, sorry, very confident the person's not leaving, even though the recent evidence suggests that they are. And it's also in, done some mysterious inferences. So it is inferred that there's an event here in this corridor. But that event doesn't really explain the up and down motion that they were doing between these two locations. So they've missed some key events, and they're just wrong about, about the answer. So this is great. We've successfully crashed this inference program. Um, so now if we remove the MCMC kernels completely and just run particle filtering, things get even worse. So now the algorithm is very confident that there were these three events that happened in the bathroom, even though the person never walked anywhere near the bathroom. So this is basically a garbage result. And again, we successfully crashed the program. So the takeaway is that a combination of open universe models supported by Gen and specialized inference algorithms in those models, which also leverage Gen's support, um, are important for more robust inferences. And closed universe models or generic inference algorithms operating open universe models won't be as robust. So now I'll show how Gen supports two of the key inference ideas used to make this work. Uh, one is specialized trans-dimensional MCMC. And I'll talk about that first. 
So one of our specialized kernels switches between the leave and stay model. So how do we switch between these two uh, branches? So suppose we start with a trace where the person is leaving and we want to propose a trace where the person is staying. So in order to do this, we need to generate or fill in values for the random choices in this other branch, in the stay branch. So how do we generate those values? Well, the standard approach in existing probabilistic programming systems is to employ forward sampling, where we execute the new branch code as usual and ignore the values of choices in the other branch. So this approach is pretty inefficient. Um, in this case, we had a decent explanation for the data in the leave branch in terms of this person searching for their keys. But when we propose the new values for the stay branch, these waypoints are just unrelated to the data. So this proposal is very unlikely to be accepted and we'll have to propose thousands of times before we happen to get values that actually explain the data well and can be accepted. So Gen, Gen lets users write more efficient um, moves that transform the data in the previous branch into the trace of the new branch. So in this case, there's a pretty close semantic similarity between the search locations in this leave model and the waypoints in the stay model, right? They both represent locations that the person is moving to and then moving on from, from there. So one simple approach is just to copy the values from search locations, reinterpret them as waypoints of unknown purpose in the other model. And this actually gives us a hypothesis for the stay model that explains the data pretty decently and has a good chance of being accepted as a result. So, but what transformations are we allowed to do here? Uh, and how do we guarantee that it has the right stationary distribution in the end? In other words, is this algorithm correct in any sense? So there is an existing mathematical framework for representing this sort of move called reversible jump MCMC. And this framework involves establishing a bijection between two spaces of random variables, which in our case corresponds to two sets of traces. So this framework is really flexible. It even works when the two spaces have different dimensionality. And this is done by extending the two models temporarily with additional random variables so that they have the same distribution, uh, the same dimension. Um, one challenge with this is that computing the acceptance probability is complicated, but it also involves computing the determinant of this bijection, the determinant of the Jacobian of this bijection. So note also that forward sampling, which is employed by most existing probabilistic programming systems is also an instance of this reversible jump framework, but a very inefficient one where there is actually no transfer of information between the two traces. So Gen provides a novel programming construct that makes it easier to implement reversible jump MCMC moves and it leverages two languages. Uh, first, there's the same probabilistic modeling language used to write generative models is used to express these two probability distributions. Second, the bijection is, is implemented in a bijection DSL that Gen provides. Um, and using these two DSLs, Gen automates the acceptance ratio computation. So I'll give an example. Here is the bijection DSL code for our switch move. The first line here reads the current value of this is leaving value, uh, choice and writes the logical negation of that value to the new trace. So it's just switching back and forth. And this mathematical description is shown on the right. So if we're switching from leaving to staying, then we have to set the number of waypoints in the model to the number of search attempts in the, in the original model plus one. And finally, this block of code defines how the continuous random choices in the new trace should be generated from those in the old trace. So here we're simply copying the destination location into the last waypoint address. And here we're copying each search location into the appropriate waypoint. And the Jacobian for this transformation, uh, Jacobian of this transformation is shown on the right. Um, in this case, it has a simple sparse structure due to the fact that we're simply copying values instead of transforming them in more complicated ways. But in general, Gen will use automatic differentiation to compute this for the user while also exploiting the sparsity structure when it's present. Um, and again, Gen automatically computes the acceptance probability automatically. But Gen also can optionally run a dynamic check that checks that the inverse of this bijection takes you back to the original trace. And this dynamic check, like the ones employed by the custom, uh, by the composite kernel DSL I described earlier, are very useful for detecting errors in inference code. So Gen lets you use both 
generic MCMC kernels, like the forward sampling ones I talked about, as well as the more efficient ones. And there's trade-offs here between ease of use and efficiency. So the generic one requires just one line of code in gen, whereas the more efficient one requires 26 lines of code. But the uh, trade-off is often worth using the more efficient one. So for example, in low data dimension, the generic one can be, can be useful. Um, but as soon as you go up to 75 time steps in this case, uh, so a higher dimensional problem, the generic kernel basically becomes useless, whereas the more efficient kernels continues to be accepted. So this reversible jump technique in gen has been applied for all sorts of models, uh, including clustering, Bayesian synthesis in DSLs, and inference over 3D scene graph structures. OK, so now I'll describe another complementary inference technique uh, in this model based on using probabilistic inference in a simpler model to accelerate inference in the original, more sophisticated model. And on the right is a discretization of this floor plan into these rectangular cells. So instead of modeling the precise location of the person over time, we could just model what cell they are in at a given time. And instead of using a path planning algorithm to generate trajectories, we could just use a simple Markov transition model on cells for each destination cell. So for example, if the person starts off at cell 10 in blue and their destination is cell one in red, then the transition model says that they're probably headed into cell nine or cell six next. So where do we get these transition models from? Well, one option is to generate a lot of prior samples from the original planner-based model and then train the simpler Markov model to fit this data. And this makes the coarse Markov model sort of a surrogate model. So the resulting discrete model of this domain is a mixture of hidden Markov models, one for each destination cell. And now the observations are at the cell level, not the coordinate level. So here's the coarse-grained generative model described in one of Jen's modeling languages. Uh, it samples the destination cell from a uniform distribution over, over the floor plan. And then it samples hypothetical data using an HMM. So posterior inference in this mixture of HMMs is efficient and straightforward. Um, and some of these inferences are showing here. But the results are at the cell level and not the individual location level. So Jen uses a novel probabilistic programming construct called trace translators to allow users to easily bridge between the latent representations of these two models. So for the model of this person walking around, um, to translate from the coordinate to the, to the grid-based model, we just find what cell the coordinate is in. That's pretty straightforward. To go in the opposite direction, to go from a cell to a point, we just sample a random point inside the cell. So Jen automatically computes the weight shown here, uh, which is useful, which is required for this operation. Um, and it does that using these two models, P1 and P2, um, and also these two auxiliary models, Q1 and Q2, which are both also written in, this, uh, in the modeling languages. And also it uses the bijection H, which is implemented in Jen's bijection DSL. So this construct is actually a generalization of the construct that Jen uses for reversible jump MCMC to the case where we're translating between two different models that have different latent representations instead of two control flow paths within the same model. And inference strategies like this can be much more efficient than strategies that only use the original more complex model. So here the orange line shows the accuracy of a coarse defined SMC algorithm, sequential Monte Carlo, um, that first does inference in the simpler model and then translates these traces to the original more complex model. And this outperforms an algorithm that only uses the more complex model. Okay. Um, so now I'll talk a bit about how neural networks can be used with Gen. So Gen supports hybrid inference architectures that combine neural, Bayesian, and symbolic components. Uh, so one promising approach to inference that Gen supports uses neural networks trained on data simulated from a generative model and combines that with Monte Carlo model-based inference. So in particular, we can use the neural network as a proposal distribution within model-based Monte Carlo inference. And the neural network proposals are fast, but they're approximate, and they can be inaccurate when you get unusual data or when there's distribution shift. In contrast, the model-based Monte Carlo algorithms are more computationally expensive, but can provide robustness when the neural network fails due to distribution shift or, or data, or unusual data. And Gen is a good platform for research into how to dynamically allocate 
effort and navigate between these two different bottom-up and model-based approaches. So here's a simple demo implemented in Gen that I showed earlier. Uh, this is a model-based Monte Carlo algorithm for tracking the pose of a camera from depth data. And here's an anecdotal example showing how neural networks uh, in generative models can be used together with Gen in, a, in an example like this. So on the left, I trained a neural network to track the pose of a camera given a point cloud. And um, here the black points are the observed point cloud data and the green points are the reprojections. Um, and the camera icon is the inferred camera location. The ground truth is basically the camera is just pitching up and down in regular intervals. Um, so the neural network on the left is a little jittery, but it's, it's fast um, and performs fine. On the right, I'm showing a hybrid approach, which uses the neural network as a proposal within a Monte Carlo inference algorithm based on the generative model. And this algorithm is a little slower, as you can see, but it's a little more robust. So now when, so now this neural network though, I only trained on this limited range of pitch angles shown here in yellow. Uh, if we test this algorithm on data that was out of its distri training distribution, for example, if the camera was facing straight up or facing straight down, then the neural network just doesn't work in this case, which is not surprising. But when we embed this inside the hybrid Monte Carlo plus neural network algorithm, that algorithm still functions uh, because it's able to reject the proposals made by the neural network when it's unreliable. So there's a lot more work to be done in scaling up this type of, of inference approach to more challenging problems. But Gen is a great platform for doing that sort of work. So here's an earlier example of the application to training, uh, to explaining a person's motion uh, from 2017. And in this version, I trained a neural network to predict the location of a waypoint from the person's observed trajectory. Um, and this plot shows that using the neural network as a proposal greatly improves the efficiency of the MCMC algorithm. This example was also adapted for use in the class, uh, 6885, as part of the problem set and was re-implemented in, in Gen PyTorch. So uh, in addition to neural network heuristics, like the one I, I talked about earlier, you can also use symbolic uh, heuristic algorithms as data-driven proposals. So here I am applying the Raymer Douglas Puker algorithm, which simplifies line, lines, basically simplifies paths into a set of line segments uh, in order to detect turning points in the person's path, which are putative examples of, of waypoints. And we get a proposal distribution based on this uh, heuristic on the right. And then finally, using Gen, we can also combine neural nets with more symbolic heuristics to create neurosymbolic proposals. Uh, here is a preliminary result showing that combining a data-driven data proposal that combines RANSAC for robust model fitting, plus a neural network that predicts how accurate RANSAC will be on a given problem, requires a lot less training data to reach the same level of accuracy than just using the neural network alone. And here's a proposal program written in an earlier version of Jen's modeling language for that example. Uh, it starts by running RANSAC using parameters that were tuned on the training data. Then it runs the neural network to predict how confident it is in RANSAC's output for that data set and adds the appropriate amount of noise to the hypothesis returned by RANSAC. And then it uh, uses conditional sampling in the generative model to actually sample the outlier statuses for each data point. So again, Gen is a good platform for research into this sort of hybrid neurosymbolic algorithm. Okay, so now I'll talk a little about what's going on under the hood in Gen. Uh, first, it's useful to separate between these different components involved in a probabilistic programming system. So here the user's model is on top and the inference code is on the bottom. So within the inference code, I found it useful to factor between the inference algorithm and the low-level implementation. And what I mean by inference algorithm are things like the proposals, variational families, MCMC kernels, and so on. And by low-level implementation, I mean things like dependency tracking, incremental computation, automatic differentiation, and the data structures used for storing traces. So as I mentioned earlier, a challenge with early universal probabilistic programming systems is that they didn't, uh, didn't specialize either the algorithm or the low-level implementation to the user's model, which limited their performance. So some systems that came after allowed for more specialization of the inference algorithm to the model, but it is still too limited. And one of the reasons that that was limited is because these algorithms are tightly coupled to the low-level implementation details 
of the language, making it difficult to extend the set of algorithms supported. So instead, Jen decouples the low-level implementation from the inference algorithm using this trace abstract data type. And this makes it a lot easier to develop new inference algorithms. Uh, in fact, users just program them directly using regular code without referencing any language implementation details at all. Um, and it also allows us to specialize the low-level implementation to the model um, and also extend with new modeling languages easily. So the trace abstract data type gives a set of low-level primitives for infer implementing inference algorithms. This includes regular trace execution of the model uh, with simulate. But it also includes taking gradients with respect to trainable parameters via automatic differentiation. Um, besides trainable parameters, you can also differentiate with respect to the values of random choices as well as the arguments of models. Another interesting and important primitive operation supported by traces is update, which is used to make changes to random choices, like switching branches as we saw earlier. So, we, And this update allows um, models to do this in a way that the implementation can exploit incremental computation. So for example, Jen's static modeling language uses static computation graphs to generate faster trace implementations that exploit incremental computation. In this benchmark of the simple model of a person's motion, the static modeling language implementation gives around three and a half speed up, three and a half times speed up over the dynamic modeling language implementation, which is more flexible language, but does not perform incremental computation. It doesn't analyze the computation graph. And also, Jen's modeling, language are, modeling languages are interoperable. So you can write a model in one language that invokes the model written in another language. And that allows you to decide which trace implementation makes the most sense for different parts of your generative model. So in the discrete model for the person's movement here, I'm calling a hidden Markov model from the dynamic modeling language. And the hidden Markov model internally is using a fast implementation based on dynamic programming. So my dissertation contains a mathematical formalization of the trace data type in Jen. Um, Jen also includes a combinator modeling language that provides structured control flow combinators. For example, Jen's recurse combinator expresses a restricted pattern of recursion that's common in models based in probabilistic context free grammars. And models built with this combinator use specialized dependency tracking logic that avoids recomputing subtrees in the parse graph. This approach to incremental computation is very different than the one that Venture uses. Uh, Venture uses a general purpose dynamic dependency tracking, which has high overhead. And this allows us to get a 100x speed up of our venture on a Gaussian process structure voting problem. In this other benchmark, combining a static modeling language implementation with the combinators gives a 250x speed up for a Bayesian regression and outliers problem uh, over venture, and where inference is done using MCMC and gradient descent. And finally, Jen also outperforms other systems at sequential Monte Carlo inference, and this is due to two separate reasons. Uh, first is the, is the ability to use a customized specialized proposal. So instead of the generic proposal based on forward sampling, uh, here's Jen, use, Jen uses a customized one. And this gives a 16x speed up. Uh, separately though, Jen's low level implementation also contributes an additional 4x speed up over the fastest baseline here uh, when both Jen and the baseline are using the generic proposal. So, now I'll briefly discuss some next steps that build on this work. Um, Jen's current architecture allows for two types of spe specialization, as I mentioned, right? The inference algorithm can be specialized to the model, but also the low-level implementation can be specialized to the model. Um, and currently though, the abstract data type, right, limits the ability to specialize the low-level implementation to the algorithm itself. So specializing the low-level implementation to more of the context of the inference algorithm is an important next step for improving performance of inference programs in Gen. Um, so one interesting research question is how to do this without overcomplicating the trace abstract data type that separates these two components of the architecture and losing the extensibility and flexibility and ease of use of the inference programming model as a result. So one possible approach is based on the observation that if we specialize the implementation of a trace operation to the set of random choices that are involved, then we could generate faster code for a variety of algorithms because these algorithms tend to operate on different random choices, but in regular and predictable patterns. So I described an early prototype of this approach in a workshop paper, but I didn't have time, I didn't have the right set of primitive operations at the time. So I paused that work. And now that we have a set of primitive operations for inference that has been validated across a variety of inference applications, I think it makes sense to return to this problem. 
Um, so it should also, it should be possible to infer, to statically analyze the inference algorithm code and infer static information about the sets of random choices involved in different operations, and then request code generation for specialized implementations of trace operations from models. And this work would build on recent work in our lab on statically inferring the set of addresses that a generative model can sample um, via trace types, which was published at Popple last year. So another next step uh, for this work is building an ecosystem of modeling and inference libraries on top of Gen. And we've already begun this work focusing on reusable functionality for 3D perception. And finally, with some MIT affiliates, I'm also starting a company called Common Sense Machines that will scale up the types of modeling and inference approaches supported by Gen, uh, focusing on inverse graphics approaches to perception. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, if you're interested in Gen, I encourage you to check it out or get in touch about potential applications. Uh, and thank you all for listening. Um, but I do want to acknowledge lots of people. So this, none of this work would have been possible without support in various forms over a long period of time. So most recently from my thesis committee. Um, and in particular, I want to thank my main advisor, Vikash, for building the intellectual blueprint for this work uh, and his, for his example of independent and deep thinking uh, and for being a very caring and responsive advisor over the past five years. I also want to thank Josh for attracting me into this work in the first place with his really compelling and creative research agenda and for his constant friendly encouragement. Um, I'd also like to thank my lab mates, in particular Faraz Saad and Alex Lev for their support and camaraderie over the years and their contributions to the research. And I also want to thank everyone else I've worked with at the PropComp Lab as well as collaborators at other institutions. Um, I also want to thank my mentors before starting my PhD that helped me along this path. And I want to thank my family, in particular, my fiance, Lisa Bashkarova, who has been on my team for years and whose constant presence during this lockdown has made finishing my PhD a surprisingly fun experience. Um, I'm also particularly grateful to my parents, of course, for putting me first, providing opportunities, and pushing me to be more ambitious. Um, so I'll take any questions. So, um... Just a, a point of, of uh, procedure, we're gonna be soliciting questions in the chat. So please send a public chat uh, with a question if you have one, we'll skim those and then Marco will pick a couple to answer and we can unmute the, the people who he calls on. Okay, so I see some hands or no, I see. Yeah, I don't see any uh, in the Zoom group chat, is that right? If you wanna call on a couple of people too, you, 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 it looks like you could do that since nobody's